may be seated. I mentioned before that our speaker today is well known to us, um, but we'll introduce him anyway. Uh, Ken is, of course, a, a member of our Presbytery and has been a longtime missionary under the Independent Board for Presbyterian Home Foreign Missions, um, for serving in Cameroon and now in Brazil, and in many ways continuing the work of uh, Dr. Leroy. So uh, we're in good hands today. And uh, Brother Ken, would you preach God's word to us? Oh, I appreciated the piano playing this morning. That was very nice. Would you turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33? Ezekiel chapter 33. And we want to read a couple verses, starting with verse 23. Verse 23 of Ezekiel chapter 33. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Let's vow in prayer. O Lord, we thank thee for thy goodness unto us. We thank thee once again for thy word. We thank thee for the opportunity that we have to study thy word. And, O Lord, we pray that thou would bless it to our hearts. We pray that we might see what thou hast to say to us here from the book of Ezekiel. And, O Lord, we see that the Bible is more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. In Jesus' name, amen. And this is more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. Here in Ezekiel, we have Ezekiel talking to Israel and talking about the exact same things we have going on in the church today. Now here we have in the beginning verses here, verses 23 and 24, we have the people of Israel. And many of the people of Israel were living in the wasteland. They were living in desert areas. They were living in areas where the farming was no good. Uh, Israel is only, always known as a land of lots of rocks. My sister went over there to visit years ago and she came back saying that one thing she really remembered about Israel that there were rocks everywhere. And you know, rocks aren't very good for farming. And not everywhere is full of rocks there, but many places. And these wastes here that they were living in were poor areas. And they were poor because they were living in these wastelands. They couldn't grow much in the way of crops, and farming was the main thing in Israel. And so they were in those wastes. They were in bad shape. But it came to them that, the, that Abraham, back in the Old Testament, back at the beginning of the Old Testament, of course this is Old Testament here too, but at, back at the beginning of the Old Testament, back in the book of Genesis, Abraham was promised the land of Israel and promised the good land of Israel, the good parts of it. And so the people there that were living in the wastelands, they decided that they would take that promise to Abraham to themselves. And they decided that we will take over the land, that God has given us the good land of Israel, and we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. And so they were naming the promise of God to Abraham, and they were claiming that promise for themselves because they were Jews. Well, is this a good way to approach the promises of God in the Bible, the physical promises of God? Of course, there are physical promises and spiritual promises in the Bible. But here's a physical promise, to have the land. And can we just pick out a promise from somewhere in the Old Testament and apply it to ourselves? Well, no, we can't do that. Today we have the Pentecostal charismatic movement, and they have the doctrine, more or less, of name it and claim it. They name the promises from the Old Testament especially, the promises of prosperity in the Old Testament to Abraham and to other people. They name those promises and then they claim those promises. And they say, oh, well, we, well God's going to give us those because we're claiming these promises of God because didn't God make these promises to Christians and we're just going to claim those for ourselves and we're going to have it 
And we're going to have faith in that. Well, that's what the children of Israel did right here. They named and claimed the promise that was given to Abraham before. But you know, we really can't do that. We can't name and claim promises, physical promises from the Bible. And you know, the physical promises in the Bible were never made to all people at all times, to all Christians at all times. And this promise to Abraham was made to some of his descendants. God promised Abraham that, that he would give him the land, and he would give the land to his descendants. But not to all of his descendants. Most of Abraham's descendants would not have the land. As we go through history, most of Abraham's descendants didn't have the land of Israel and haven't had it. And so this promise of Abraham's descendants having, part, having the land of Israel is only given to some of his descendants. And so these people here, they've decided, they've decided for God that those promises apply to them in particular. Well, that's very presumptuous. We can't just grab promises of God and apply them to ourselves. Uh, when It's according to God's will who is going to have this promise fulfilled. And who is going to have the land is according to God's will, not to the will of people who just up and decide that they're going to claim God's promise to the land or any other promise of God. Well, today they preach prosperity. The Pentecostals, Charismatics, uh, they're taking over the land of Brazil, as I've told you before. And, of course, they're doing quite a bit of that here in the United States as well. And, you know, uh, they preach a gospel of prosperity. They take the Old Testament promises of prosperity to Abraham and others, and they apply them to themselves, and they preach that all, God wants all Christians to be prosperous financially. In fact, one famous Pentecostal preacher in Brazil, he puts out a, a Bible, and the title of the Bible is the Financial Prosperity Bible, right on the cover of it. And, you know, God never promised financial prosperity to anyone in particular. It's according to his will who he gives it to and who doesn't have it. Some Christians will be financially prosperous and some will not be, according to his will and not according to us claiming his promise to be prosperous. And we do know that God wants every Christian to be prosperous spiritually. He wants every Christian to go to heaven. He wants every Christian to have spiritual blessings in this life. But God never promised to give every Christian financial and physical prosperity. Well, we go on here, verses 25 and 26. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile every one his neighbor's wife, and shall ye possess the land? Here's God speaking, and God says that those people that are naming and claiming the promises to Abraham are not going to get those promises. And he, God says, shall ye possess the land? They're not going to possess the land. They're not going to have that prosperity. Number one, because it's not according to God's sovereign will to give it to them. And number two, they're not even living for the Lord. They're not even serving the Lord. They're living in sin. <coughs> and many of their sins are listed right here. They eat with the blood. Remember back in the Bible, it's, they were told to never eat blood. And in the New Testament even, in Acts chapter 15, they were told that they weren't supposed to eat with the blood. Well, here they did that in Israel. They lifted up their eyes toward their idols. They were in idolatry, they were in adultery, verse 26, they were committing violence, they were stealing other people's things, uh, how, they were living upon their sword, standing upon their sword, they were using their sword to take things from other people, to steal. <coughs> and they were working abomination, and God said, shall ye possess the land. They would not possess the land. 
And you know, the people of Israel had not the slightest right to expect these promises would be given to them, especially when they were living in sin. It's just like with salvation. You know, can a Christian fall into sin and still be a Christian? Can a Christian be backslidden and still be a Christian? Well, yes, he can. But the problem is, when a Christian is in sin, when a Christian is backslidden, he has no assurance of his salvation. He has no right to expect that he's a Christian, <coughs> even though he might be one. And here, these people were living in sin, they were worshiping idols, and yet they were naming and claiming the promises of God. Well, then God goes on, verse 27, Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the, the wastes shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open field will I give to the beasts to be devoured. And they, that, and they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of the strength shall cease. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the man, land most desolate, because of all their abominations which they have committed. And so here we have, uh, God is going to give them not the good land of Israel, but God's going to give them desolation. He's going to give them exactly the opposite of what they were naming and claiming. Uh, God would have those that are in the waste to fall by the sword. Then he'd send the beasts after them, uh, probably lions and other beasts that would devour them. And then finally, the ones that were safe from the beasts and from the sword in their forts and caves, they would die of the pestilence. And God would lay the land most desolate, the exact opposite of what they were naming and claiming. But what is happening with the prosperity churches today? You know, I think many times God gives them exactly the opposite of what they're naming and claiming. We have some relatives in Brazil who have been in the Pentecostal movement for many years, and we haven't seen any prosperity in their lives, even though that's what they preach in their churches. In fact, they've gone down and down and down. Uh, in fact, the prosperity in these churches, the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, is mostly prosperity for the preacher and for the leader. And they live in uh, great luxury with uh, airplanes, with uh, Rolls Royces, with big mansions. Uh, but the people, they don't get the prosperity. And of course, even if they did, it wasn't necessarily that God that gave them, to it, gave them it. And so God says, I will lay the land most desolate, that shall ye inherit the land, shall ye possess the land. God says that naming and claiming didn't count for anything. And then God said he would lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease. You know, these uh, charismatic Pentecostal churches are really big today. Now, of course, we in our fundamental churches were very small, but they're huge. They have humongous churches. They have big television ministries. They have all kinds of things. Uh, they have great pomp. Well, eventually God's going to lay that uh, desolate. God's going to bring that to naught eventually because they're preaching a false gospel, preaching that every God, everybody should be prosperous financially, every Christian. And that's not true according to God's word. That's saying to people they will have peace when there is no peace. Preaching lies. Then we go on to verse 30. Verse 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. 
And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Well, it's interesting here, these people that were naming and claiming the land there, they were talking against Ezekiel. They were talking against him. Verse 30, The children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. Why were they talking against Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel was telling them things that they didn't want to hear. You know, that was the job of a prophet in the Bible. A prophet was a guy who told people what they didn't want to hear. And Ezekiel had been doing that with the people of Israel, and they talked against them. They didn't like it. And, of course, the people of Israel many times put prophets to death and persecuted them because they told them things they didn't want to hear. They told them the truth. And the truth was that God was going to lay the land desolate, not that they were going to inherit the land. The false prophets would tell them that they would inherit the land, but Ezekiel was telling them the truth. And what do you suppose they were saying about Ezekiel? I'm sure they were saying about him that he was too narrow, that he was too much of a fundamentalist, that he took things too literally in the Bible, and that he was too much of a legalist. And he wanted people to keep the commandments of God. He wanted people to, to, to live the gospel. And they were saying, well, don't you know what's important is what's in your heart, not whether you keep the commandments. Well, it's good to keep things in your heart and to be right in your heart. That, that is important and more important. But it's also important to keep the commandments and to serve God from day to day. And that's what the people were not doing. And they were talking here against Ezekiel. But what's interesting here is as they were speaking against Ezekiel, you go on in this verse 30, then they said, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. At the same time of speaking against Ezekiel, they said, Let's go hear what Ezekiel has to say. Now, why would they do that? Why would they go to hear Ezekiel when they really didn't like what he said? Well, it's because that was the only game in town back at that time. It's not like they had a lot of different preachers to go hear, a lot of different choices. And they wanted to appear to be the people of God. And so they went out to the church, so to speak. They went out to hear Ezekiel, even though they really didn't want to hear what he had to say, but they did say to each other, come and let us hear what is the word that cometh from the Lord. And that's exactly what they were going to do. They were just going to hear, but they were not, definitely not going to put in practice what Ezekiel had to say to them. Come, I pray you and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. Then verse 31, it's interesting here, Ezekiel says, and, well, here's the Lord is telling Ezekiel, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. Now, what does that tell you there where we, where we have that word as? As the people. The people would be the people of God, God's chosen people, the true Jews, the true Christians, if you will. They were as the people. They were as my people, but they really weren't God's people. They really weren't true Jews saved and born again. You know, people in the Old Testament were saved and born again, just as we are, except they looked forward to the Messiah as we look back to Christ the Messiah. Well, anyway, here they came looking like Christians. They came to the, to the assembly there with Ezekiel. They sat down before him. They listened to him. They looked like Christians, <coughs> but they weren't Christians. Well, what's going on in so many churches today, these huge churches that they have today? Well, we have all those people. They go into the churches as the people, 
They go in as my people. They look like they must be Christians because they're going to church. And of course, going to church is good, and a Christian should go to church. Uh, but that's all they did. And they all went to church, but they re- back here they went to church and they weren't Christians. And today we got those huge crowds going to church, and they're not Christians either, most of them. And that's the problem. We got a lot of unconverted people in the churches. And here they had, they came as the people and as my people. Then Ezekiel is told here from the Lord how you can tell that they were not truly the people of God. Because, going on to ver- with verse 31, we're in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 31, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they showeth much love, they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So they all come as the people, and they hear the words of Ezekiel, but they will not do them. They will not put in practice what Ezekiel has to say. They'll hear it, it'll go in one ear and right out the other ear, but they will not do what Ezekiel tells them to do from the Lord. And then it says here, with their mouth, they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. What was important for these people in Ezekiel's time? What was important was having some good land and getting rich and having a lot of money, being prosperous financially. Their covetousness. That's what was important to them. Well, what's important to these people that follow the prosperity theology today? Well, their covetousness is what's important for them, too. Their heart goeth after their covetousness. And, of course, you can always attract a big crowd if you tell people what they want to hear. You know, Hitler, back in World War II, he told the German people what they wanted to hear. And the prosperity preachers today tell people what they want to hear, whether it's true or whether it's not. And of course it's not true. So with their mouth, they show much love. You know, these Christians in many of these churches, you know, they won't even say hello to you on the, ro- on the road, on the street. Uh, I know some of these churches, it's some of these people that call themselves Christians in these churches, They won't even look your way so you can say hello to them. And yet they'll say, oh, I love God and I love everybody. They won't even say hello, won't even salute you. And that's a first step of showing love. But they only show it with their mouth. Of course, then the second step of love is not only saluting, but being friendly. And these people are not even friendly, very many of them. They don't salute you, they're not friendly. They don't show love, and of course there's a lot of ways to show love, but those are just the first two beginning steps of showing love. And we can show love by doing things for other people, by, uh, by helping people in need or whatever, visiting people in need. Uh, but these people, they weren't interested in doing anything to show their love, just say it with the mouth, as if saying it with the mouth was all that needed to be done. And I know a lot of people in Brazil and here in the United States, they think that all you have to do is say something with the mouth, and that's all you need to do. Nothing needs to be done about it. I remember when we were missionaries over in Cameroon. And the government there in Cameroon used to talk about the anti-corruption campaign. And they'd talk and talk and talk about the anti-corruption campaign there and how they were against corruption. And yet Cameroon at that time was ranked the number one corrupt country in the world. And they didn't do anything about the corruption, they just talked about it. And that's uh, how it is with so many Christians. They don't serve the Lord, they just talk about it. Their mouth, they show much love. Well, it's not enough just to say things with our mouth, including salvation. You know, there's so many people that think they are Christians because they said a sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I mean, that's what we need to do to be saved. But it's not enough to just say those words. We have to mean it with our heart. It has to take effect in our lives. And we're not saved by works, but works after word will show that we really meant it when we said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But words are not enough by themselves. The words are enough, but they have to be meant with the whole heart. Just to say the words is not enough. And then, many people think they're saved because they walked an aisle at an invitation in a church, in some of the good churches, the good fundamentalist churches. They think they're saved because they said the words or they walked the aisle. But we have to mean it with our whole heart and mind and soul and body. And that was the problem with the people of Israel here in Ezekiel's time. They didn't mean it with their whole heart when they said things about God, saying that they loved God with their whole heart. Well, I will submit to you that uh, why are there so many people in nursing homes? Why are there so many children in daycare, even of Christians? I believe that's a great evil. And uh, why are there so many? Is because the Christians are going after covetousness. Many times, maybe not all the time, but many times they're going after covetousness. They want to have all that money coming in. They want to have all the convenience. And they're content to not take care of the people that need care in their own household. With their mouth, they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And then verse 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And here's what the people wanted in the church. Here's what they wanted in their assembly. They wanted just somebody that they could li listen to that sp spoke great swelling words, glorious words, and they could just feast on these words and not do them, not have any effect upon their lives. They wanted them like a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice. And of course, they even made Ezekiel into that. Even though Ezekiel was preaching the truth, preaching hard-hitting messages, but they just let it go in one ear and out the other. They just completely ignored what Ezekiel had to say, at least so far as putting it into practice. It upset them a little bit, uh, but uh, they weren't interested in putting it into practice at all. He was as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice and of, that can play well on an instrument. And that's what people want in churches today. In churches today, in these prosperity churches and Many churches today, people want a preacher that gets up there and is a good storyteller. And he can just rattle off the stories and be very entertaining. And the people want that. As a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. They want to be entertained in church. But they don't want to put in practice the things of God's word. For they hear thy words, verse 32 but they do them not. And I submit to you that, you know, that you have these huge churches, these huge Pentecostal churches in Brazil. They say that 40% of Brazil is now in these Pentecostal charismatic churches. 40% of the country. And yet the country is, is in the depths of sin. The country has terrible crime and other sins. And if all those people were really Christians putting into practice uh, Christianity, all these people in these huge ch churches, it would make a difference in society. Back in the old revivals of the past with Billy Sunday and the others going way back, you know, the bars in town shut down when the revival came to town and after the revival. There was a difference in society. But today, with these huge churches and huge meetings they have, there's no difference in society. They hear thy words, but they do them not. And then verse 33. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. What's it talk about this cometh to pass? When the desolation comes to pass, lo, it will come 
upon the people of Israel, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. That a prophet had been there telling them what they didn't want to hear. You know, God here tells Ezekiel and tells the people of Israel that they were not going to turn back to him, back to the Lord, that they were not going to serve the Lord, and that they would have their land laid desolate. So what good did it do for Ezekiel to preach these things? What good did it do if they weren't going to turn to the Lord? Well, after the desolation would come, verse 33, then they would know that a prophet had been among them. They would be held account for the fact that a prophet had been there, that a prophet had warned them about the desolation, the prophet had warned them about what they were doing wrong, the prophet had warned them that they weren't putting in practice God's word, and they would know that they had been warned, even though they didn't put it into practice. And you know, God, he's interested in people being accountable. That's a big ministry that we have as being witnesses for the Lord. You know, people have said, well, you know, I don't give out tracts because most of the people reject them. And what good does it do to give out tracts if most of the people reject them? What good does it do to witness to people if they're mostly going to reject it? What good does it do? Well, it does a lot of good. And it makes people accountable even if they reject it. You know, even if you take the tract and you, and you try to give it to somebody and they never take it and they say, no, I don't want any of that. Well, you know, they knew what that tract was about. They knew what it was about and they rejected it and God will hold them accountable for that. And it does some good. God wants us to give the warning to those around us. And of course, a few of them at least will take the heed, will heed the warning and be saved. Let's go back to chapter 33, back to verse 7. Verse 7 for a second. Just the last couple of verses here. And here Ezekiel was told here in the same chapter, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And so here's another good thing, uh, giving, trying to give tracts and witnesses to people that reject it. We are delivering our own soul. We're doing what God wants us to do, and we're obeying him and giving out a witness even though they reject it, trying to give a tract even though they reject it, even though they throw it away. They'll be held accountable for it, and we will have their blood not on our hands. And you know, we do have a responsibility to give out the gospel to people around us, to give out the good news. And you know, as a Calvinist, as a Presbyterian, I know that their salvation, the salvation of someone else, does not depend upon me. I know that. And I know that if they're God's elect, God's going to get them saved one way or the other. But if I refuse to give the gospel to them, someone else will give it to them, and I will reap the uh, chastisement of God, because I'm not doing what I should be doing. And so Ezekiel told the people of Israel, that they could not name and claim the promises of God, the physical promises of prosperity. They couldn't name and claim that. That's completely false to do that. And they would have the exact opposite come upon them. They would have desolation come upon them. And when all that would come to pass, then they would know that a prophet had been among them. 
Let's bow in prayer. O Lord, we thank Thee for Thy goodness unto us. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for Ezekiel. We pray, O Lord, that we might take to heart everything from Ezekiel, that we should take to heart and help us to forget everything that was not from Thy Word. Guide us each day. Help us to be the Christians that Thou would have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.